This is the story of a university, a great university, Dalhousie in Halifax. Dalhousie is one of the oldest of Canadian universities. It was founded in Halifax in 1818 and bears the name of its founder, Lord Dalhousie, then governor of Nova Scotia. Today, Dalhousie, Dal for short, is like other Canadian universities, bursting at the seams with the doctors, the lawyers, the dentists, the executives, and the writers of tomorrow. More than 2,500 students swarm over the campuses that make up a sprawling institution that has earned an impressive reputation nationally as well as internationally. And the ex population explosion lies dead ahead. Enrollment is mushrooming 9 to 10 percent a year. By 1966, the university expects to have to handle 3,500 students, an increase of 40 percent in three years. Can universities handle this increase? Can they build the facilities, equip the laboratories, find the faculty members to maintain their standards and not cost quality overboard in face of the need for mass production of educated humans? For your university is not a factory. It's a throbbing collection of specialists working with individuals and dedicated to improving the cultural and scientific lot of humanity. It is the birthplace of ideas, both the arts and sciences. And these are troubled times which have caved in the walls of whatever ivory towers have been erected on campuses. Within the walls of the Greystone Science Building, Dalhousie delves into research which will help the expanding industrial base of Canada in the future. Here, an experiment dealing with materials at low temperatures. Liquid helium is used to bring the temperature of lead in this experiment to near absolute zero. At this chilling temperature, the metal changes its character and becomes a superconductor. In addition, the lead emits a force field strong enough to hold a magnet in midair. Another field of investigation in Dalhousie's laboratories, melting metal without containers. Postgraduate students work in this experiment in which metal is heated because each metallic element has a magnetic moment can be suspended in mid-air. In an experiment of this type, it is possible to reach a temperature similar to that on the sun. There is no container for the metal because it would melt. A university is a blend of scores of fields, all loosely tied together under the label of such and such university. But each institution is noted for outstanding achievements in one or more phases of its work. For Dalhousie, there is little doubt that the law school, which was unmatched in Canada until recent years, and its fabled medical school have ranked with the best anywhere. The Dalhousie Law School this year had students from 21 different universities. Included among them were honors graduates in history, economics, political science, modern languages and literature, engineering, architecture, chemistry, physics, geology. They came from every one of the 10 Canadian provinces from Newfoundland to British Columbia. In addition, they came to study law at Dow from Bermuda and Trinidad and Nigeria and Hong Kong and even the United States. The chief justices of four Canadian provinces came from this law school. Two of Canada's 13 prime ministers graduated from Dalhousie's Hall. The dean of the Dalhousie Law School is Horace E. Reed, 
one of the greatest legal minds in Canada, one of the greatest in the world. Dean Reed has been a part of the Dalhousie Law School for 42 years of its elegant 80-year history. I asked this famed legal mind what he looked for in a law student, what he looked for when he gauged the value of a man seeking to be a barrister at law. Well, first of all, we must remember that a lawyer is concerned with people and how they live. Uh, he's uh, concerned with the interests of people that necessarily conflict when uh, they are living together in an organized community. And the function of law is the reconciliation of conflicting interests with uh, the objective of uh, adjusting their relationships and interests uh, according to ideas of fairness or justice prevailing at the given time and place. Consequently, I would say that he must first have a liking for people and an interest in them. You must remember that uh, a lawyer is uh, entrusted with the vital affairs of his client. He must always put the affairs of his client ahead of his own comfort and his own uh, personal interests if he's to fulfill his function as he should in the community. He uh, is concerned with solving problems of, uh, of his clients according to law. Therefore, an analytical capacity is a very important qualification for a prospective law student and prospective lawyer. Furthermore, he spends uh, most of his professional life in communicating ideas from himself to other people. The means, of course, of communicating ideas is the use of words or language. He should, therefore, uh, gain a mastery of language and clarity of expression. The uh, in his college uh, work, he should beware of dogmatic teachers uh, and uh, should attempt to receive his uh, instruction, or be perhaps I can phrase it better, or be associated with. Uh, university teachers who encourage critical thought and independence, intellectual independence in part of the student. He should select, uh, in his college work, he should elect, uh, select uh, courses that are designed to assist him to identify and understand the moral and intellectual uh, and cultural values that contribute most to the sustenance and advance of civilization. Uh, I would say that any course in college that promotes the habit of precise, analytical, and reflective thinking can best equip a student for the educational process and program that he will encounter when he enters law school. In the four Atlantic provinces of Canada, Dalhousie has the only faculties of medicine and dentistry. 
Its essential role in building this portion of the country is underscored by the fact that it educates more than 85% of the young men and women from the region who choose medicine or dentistry as the career. The demand for dentists in an expanding nation has also put pressure on Dow's dentistry faculty. During the next five years, the number of students enrolled in dental clinical years is expected to double. Faced with a student explosion, Dalhousie plans to raise and spend four and a half million dollars on a new medical science building. Into it will go new facilities for the training of the so-called health team, plus expansion of the university's significant medical research. Behind doors labeled anatomy, microanatomy, biochemistry, physiology, pharmacology, will go fresh classrooms and scientific facilities for training the physicians and surgeons, the doctors and dentists, the research scientists who will guard health in a growing Canada of the late 20th century. Dalhousie maintains public health clinics and works with many hospitals, including the giant Victoria General Hospital in Halifax, on the realities of medical problems. Fledgling doctors under expert guidance or with nursing assistants deal with the routine and the difficult in acquiring a medical education. Through the university's carefully kept records in association with hospital authorities, through its pathology laboratory, has come an accumulation of evidence on the path and progress of medical problems. The compilation and analysis of these medical records are in themselves an essential role for researchers looking for the one break, the key clue that can lead to discovery of another magic bullet, another defeat for disease, another victory for mankind. From cancer to the common cold, Dalhousie University joins with other Canadian and world institutions in a combined war on disease. Dalhousie has been developing rapidly through the past decade as a medical research center. Grants from the Medical Research Council of Canada for 1963-64 alone amounted to $150,000 and covered 15 different fields of medical research. the titles of the medical research projects are a maze of long, difficult words. But to the assistant dean of medicine at Dalhousie, Dr. Lloyd McPherson, the research program and the vital need for expansion are day-to-day -day realities which his department must meet and must conquer if medicine is to continue to progress. In the uh, Faculty of Medicine at Dalhousie University, we have a, uh, an extensive research program, medical research program in progress, uh, at least uh, 50 projects at the present time, covering a, a wide uh, range of subjects, of course. Uh, some of them that come to mind are cardiopulmonary research, that is having to do with diseases of the heart and lungs, cancer research, of course, both on a fundamental and an applied level. Some of the fundamental research is rather unspectacular, having to do with the growth of both normal and abnormal cells, but uh, without a doubt it is in this area that some of the uh, uh, advances in this field are going to come. The faculty of medicine is uh, known on a worldwide basis for its uh, uh, research in X-ray microscopy and um, work is in progress having to do with uh, the nature of viruses, with uh, um, epidemics and so on, children's diseases, particularly the, uh, some of the mental retardation that occurs in children. And uh, 
money to support this research is not too difficult to come by. As a matter of fact, there are uh, a number of projects uh, which we know of for which funds are available, but which, for which we do not have the space. And this is the problem at the present time. This is the reason for our planning for this uh, uh, large new building we're working on. Uh, at least 50% of the space in that building will be for research. Uh, the research program, which is an integral part of a modern faculty of medicine, cannot go forward uh, without this new building. And uh, <coughs> the research program cannot go forward, of course, without the uh, money to pay for personnel and space uh, in which they can work. As I said, we can get uh, money for apparatus and for technical help, but the money that we are looking for is for uh, scientific personnel and space for them to work in. A concrete example of medical research and actual accomplishment is in the use of what a layman might call a heart machine, or what is technically known as a ballistocardiograph machine. This piece of equipment, handled by Dr. William Josenhan, is one of the few of its kind in the world. Its job is to study the pumping action of blood in the heart and great vessels in a live person. This machine already is reported in use in at least one case as a diagnostic machine in a hospital and is intended for this role ultimately in parallel with the electrocardiograph. Dr. Josenhan, who works in other fields such as muscular dystrophy, utilizes the ballistocardiograph machine to learn more about the heart and what goes wrong with it. The more we learn about the heart and its function, the closer we are to defeating heart disease. Another breakthrough was scored by the head of the Department of Pharmacology, Dr. J.G. Alder. His achievement, an automatic siphon machine aimed at determining how seriously a person has been poisoned and how much treatment he requires. Dr. Aldous' machine is currently being perfected for use in hospitals. The machine's basic aim is the determination of an individual's acidity. This establishes how much of an overdose of drugs or poison the patient has taken. This is recorded accurately on a graph which the physician can study and then can recommend dosage as an antidote. For Dr. Aldous' busy department, another vital field is the testing of new drugs. Rats are used in a limited manner in the research and development of new pharmaceutical means of combating infection. form one of two cities of rodents built inside the university, with mice forming the second. Clear plastic cases form the homes of the rats, handled without concern, even by female laboratory workers. These rats are being used in a comprehensive experiment aimed at diabetes. Certain substances placed in the bloodstream of the rat apparently help lower the sugar content in the blood. If it works on rats, will it work on humans? Is the scientist on the way to discovery of a substitute for insulin? Months, even years from now, research may prove or disprove this possibility. The mice are used in research aimed at cancer. A city of mice provides the living organism used in first creating a cancerous condition then dealing with it. The mice are shaved in their unknowing deal with science. An agent for creating cancer, or suspected of causing cancer, is painted on the exposed body, which is very close and characteristic to human skin. The cancer created, its growth is watched, studied and recorded day by day, and the scientists go to work on combating the disease. A 
thousand projects then, a million problems, all calling for the application of Canadian intelligence, trained intelligence. The pupils are there, but more and more teachers are needed, more facilities, more test tubes in which the culture of tomorrow can be conceived and nurtured and brought to strong maturity. For the student of today is the key to the future. On whether the universities of this generation do their job well depends the fate of the next generation, and on them, still another generation, and so on, in an endless chain of tomorrows, born from a carefully thought out today. We visited the president-elect of Dalhousie University, Dr. Henry Hicks, the former premier of Nova Scotia, to ply him with questions, questions about the future. Dr. Hicks, why has there been this uh, staggering growth in university enrollment in Canada? It's, it's growing faster than population. Well, it's growing faster than population, but not a great deal faster than the population growth in the age group concerned. Uh, we got a bulge in the population, let us say, of our secondary schools following the primary schools after the war with the high birth rate then, and this is now just getting into the university. But also, we are experiencing, and I'm glad to be able to report this, uh, a time when a larger proportion of boys and girls of university age are seeking university education. In other words, we're educating a bigger proportion of our young men and women for the future generation, if you like. In what faculty or faculties is, is this uh, pace of growth the fastest? Oh, it's the fastest in the, uh, in the undergraduate faculties of arts and science and the related schools of commerce and things like this, merely because more of a uh, selection process has taken place before students get on to the law school and the professional schools of medicine and dentistry. However, the pressure on our medical school at Dalhousie is much greater now than it has ever been at any time before in our history. Are you able to staff your faculties as well are under these strains that are taking place today? Well, there is a growing scarcity of top quality university teachers all over the Western world. I think that I can say that at Dalhousie we've been very fortunate thus far and that we have been able to get good staff and to maintain a high caliber in our uh, professorial rank. It is becoming more difficult. This is one reason why we have to do more graduate work here in the maritime provinces. In other words, the time has passed when we can bring in all our university teachers from those who were trained in Toronto or Montreal or the United States or in Europe. And therefore, the accent on Dalhousie's Faculty of Graduate Studies uh, is relevant to the shortage or the impending shortage of good university teachers. We'll have to produce more of them ourselves. What about the smaller university? Is it suffering under these circumstances? Are, are uh, your, the larger universities luring the better people away from them? Oh, them. this is a problem, of course, uh, with which we uh, maritimers have always uh, had to contend. Uh, there are more generous salaries available in the wealthier central provinces and in British Columbia and Alberta. And uh, we occasionally do fail to get people that we would like to have because we can't match the salaries of UBC and Toronto. Uh, and we know that we have to improve our own salary scale. We're trying to do this. This is part of the, uh, the uh, reason for the big Dalhousie campaign. Five million dollars of that money is earmarked to add to our endowment fund to improve our professorial salary. Well, actually, when I was talking of big universities, mm -hmm. I was considering <coughs> Dalhousie a big university. I uh, of the smaller institutions. Well, uh, the problem uh, applies to different degrees as you go up or down the scale, as the case may be. We are more fortunate, that is true, than some of the other universities in the Atlantic provinces, in that our resources are greater, uh, and we are larger, and there are certain types of professors and research wor workers who like to come in a department where they have other people to stimulate them. And in other words, it's easier to get a 12th man in a physics department if you have 11 good men than it is to get a third man in a physics department if you only have two good professors of physics. I think we do have perhaps a slightly easier time than some of our sister universities in the Maritimes in this respect, but we find it tough enough. Now, one final question, <coughs> sir. Um, what is your biggest 
biggest problem today, and is there any possibility that uh, Dalhousie, with its, for example, nationally, if not internationally famous uh, medical school and law school, is there any chance uh, that their reputations and their abilities will suffer in the near future? Well, we're determined that they will not. At the same time, we know that we have to put forth greater efforts now to make the position of our law school or our medical school than was the case a generation ago. For example, before the Second World War, the Dalhousie Law School uh, could easily claim to be in a class by itself in Canada. But since the war, good law schools have been developed uh, in uh, Queens, in Western Ontario, in UBC, making use of Dalhousie men in many instances to staff them too. And these are going to be good law schools. And therefore, if we're going to maintain our position, uh, we have to run faster uh, just to stay where we are, as Alice observed in Lewis Carroll's story, you may recall. So this is a problem, but uh, we're not going to let our standards slip. 1963 is the year in which the future of Dalhousie University was strengthened in part by the largest single endowment in its 145-year history. An anonymous benefactor, and his name can never be revealed, gave Dalhousie more than $4 million. The money will be used to establish a scholarship fund for advanced study in two fields, science and medicine, a direct contribution to Canada's future. Dalhousie will administer the fund, but students will go forth to study at other universities, hospitals, research and scientific institutes. There's one condition of the gift. Those selected to receive scholarships should be likely to contribute to the advancement of learning or to win distinction in a profession. Insofar as possible, scholarships should be granted for work leading to a doctorate, for subsequent study, or for work of similar standing. So that's the Dalhousie story, the story of a university which has filled the minds of Canadians for five crucial generations with learning, and which, in common with sister universities across the land, faces the problems of more and more young Canadians seeking a brighter tomorrow. Along the halls and in the classrooms of historic Dalhousie, they find reminders of the great men and women, great Canadians, who went before them, and whose accomplishments have helped to fashion the Canada of today and gave them opportunities in the endless tomorrow. Book has presented The Dalhousie Story. Photography and editing, Tom Cal. Audio, Ira Backman. Written and narrated by Joe King. Studio direction by Maury Jackson. This has been a CJCH Halifax film presentation.